there's a lot of people who say, how are we getting more people into the industry? How do we get more people to want to be in a truck? That's where that pay change comes in. You're listening to Sense Per Mile with your host, Charles Gracie, and his co-host, Paul Gibson. And today's guests, John Douglas and Mike Coble. They'll be tackling tough industry topics, asking even tougher questions, all to find better solutions to help make sense make sense. Welcome back to Sense Per Mile, and I'm your host, Charles Gracie. And I'm your co-host, Paul Gibson. And today we're talking about the horrors of driver's pay. You want to hear a joke first? Absolutely. Hit me with it. All right, you ready? Here's the joke. Driver pay. Ouch. (laughs) No, hey, um, this is a very dear topic for me because when we look at driver pay, we have to look at how it started. The driver pay shifted to what it is today back when things weren't regulated the way they were. But uh, a lot of times we refer to it as the wild, wild west of trucking. Back before e-logs, before governed trucks, before all the over-regulation that comes in trucking nowadays. But as things have progressed, and things progress, that's good. Progression's good sometimes. In our case of trucking, it's my honest opinion that Trucking has progressed on a lot of things, but when it came to driver pay, it stayed the same. It's the same stagnant mile where someone's getting paid per mile, and they've lost control of how many miles they get, um, how long they might be sitting in a dock. There's so many contributing factors to what determines a driver's pay. You almost need a cipher at times. You, uh, you want to have a weird math problem, try to sit down and calculate your miles when you're on a sliding pay scale. It's like you're sitting in your cab trying to figure out your paycheck and and you get it all together and you put it all together and all of a sudden the message just says drink more Ovaltine. (laughs) (laughs) When we're talking driver pay, we gotta understand these men and women are out there and we put so many governors on what determines if they're successful. You got dispatch, you got how long they're in the dock, you got the way that they're being paid, the variations of the pay out there there's got to be a simpler way. I mean, this thing has become so horrific that there's drivers getting out of the industry and going to work for Amazon or Walmart just because it's easier and they can predict their pay. So today we're going to talk about this. So uh, we got we got a couple guests today. We got a, a driver and an industry expert. Who we, who we got? So we got John Douglas, a driver that's been in the industry for years, offering many unique perspectives from his experiences within this industry. And then we got Mike Coble from 10th Street that's gonna offer his insights from his time within the industry and try to help us decipher what we call driver's pay nowadays. Mm-hmm. Nowadays, I think I think that's a weird way to put it considering it's been that way for a long time. And I think that's a big part of the problem. I mean, when you, when you look at, you know, when it was first, you know, like popular and whatever, you know, even in the Great Depression, you had the food guys who would, who would go out and they'd run 24 hours. You know, because there wasn't hours of service or anything. They could literally work as much as they were comfortable working. They could run as hard as they wanted to. And that made sense. You know, and at the same time, you had, like, you know, coal miners and stuff like that who would also have, like, piecework pay and, and that kind of stuff. But as labor laws continued, a lot of these other industries who also just kind of, like, did, uh, you know, pay per action, you know, based on results, they all shifted. But trucking never did. And then you come into 1980, you know, the situation where everything kind of changed. You know, you deregulate the industry, uh, which also created more uh, competition, which makes sense. Uh, But at the same time, in doing that, by, by creating that more competition, you know, you ended up lowering rates, which then didn't make sense to pay the drivers more. You, you have these drivers who are working with the same style of pay that even our own government has said for just about every other industry, which I don't know that, you know, I necessarily trust the government as, as a solid basis for that. But uh, they, for almost every other industry, they said this is obsolete. This isn't, this isn't friendly to workers, uh, but we still keep it going. You know, at that point, it's a gig economy. And I, I get it. it. It almost make it makes sense for like owner operators. I totally get that. Um, but at the same time, it doesn't to me make a lot of sense for company drivers. You know, it's already a hard enough life living on the road that 
to to continue that but then you you have hours of service getting tighter you have elds um you you have all these people putting speed governors on their truck um and so it's the the driver's ability to decide how profitable they want to be doing that is severely limited actually you know what might be a good example um do you have your phone on you i do by haps all right let's uh let's make a phone call uh so uh, salesperson for, for CDL Life, which is also ran by Cub Ventures, um, Willie Nelson. We're going to call him, and we're going to put him on the spot real like quick. Like the Willie Nelson? I mean, in some circles, but not <laughs> not, not not the singer by any means. But we should, uh, we should give him a call real quick. All right. Hey, Willie. This is him. Hey, man. It's Paul. Uh, so I wanted to run a quick question by you, right? All okay. right. So you're, you're a salesperson, right? Okay. In so theory. Let, yeah, in theory. Right. So let's say that uh, let's say that you're looking for a new sales job, which, which you're not. But if you were, and let's say I offered you a job, I said, hey, man, this job is completely commission, right? But okay. you can only make calls to clients between nine to five. And you can only make four calls per hour. And you have to take a lunch of one hour in the middle of your day. Uh, regardless of what you're selling, would you take that job? Man, that doesn't sound like a lot of time to make money, I'll tell you that. Right. Probably not. Yeah, that's what I thought. All right, thanks, man. Appreciate you coming out, right, Willie. It was a pleasure. So you wouldn't pay a salesperson like that, and even if you tried, the salesperson probably wouldn't take that job. I know I wouldn't work like that. That doesn't make any sense. You're, you're going to tell these people how fast they can work, how they have to work, when they can work, and it all has to fit inside of this nice little bubble. And, and, and the worst part is, is if you don't operate within that framework, you get violations, which then hurt you for the rest of your career. So it's like, it's, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to pay a driver per mile when the system is set up like that. Well, I mean, let's, let's put this into another perspective. Why is it still running this way? We know that there's a lot that goes into the lobbying for trucking. We know there's a lot that goes into the structures or what's changed and what's stayed the same. So who benefits from keeping it the same? Carriers. Yeah, I mean, that's one way to look at it, the carriers. But the other thing is, is the simplicity of how they can calculate it per mile. It's convenient. It's a convenient pay method to make sure that they maximize their efforts on their end, but with little regard to what's gone into the driver's side. Well, I mean, I think the other thing too is surplus labor. It's the idea that like the driver is only getting paid when the company can be profitable, which I get that as a business model and it makes sense. And you can't immediately go make a change because that would flip everything on its head and, and you'd risk, you know, financial ruin. But at the same time, you, you can't say, well, we're only going to pay our drivers when they're profitable when I can guarantee you that there isn't an office employee out there who is 100% productive for their entire day at their desk. You know, you have that little bit of shuffle when you get in trying to get ready. A driver wouldn't get paid for that. You know, you, you, you get up to go to the bathroom. A driver can't just stop. You can't just go like driver can't just stop and go to the back. I mean, obviously, you know, you have trucker bombs. There's that, you know, you could, <laughs> you got a gallon jug, but then you got people complaining when you throw them away, which is insane because they also complain when you don't throw them away. <laughs> uh, but whole nother podcast. Right. So it's one of those things where it's like, we pay people like that all the time. That is, that is a modern sense of labor outside of the gig economy. And so for, for truck drivers, to be paid per mile, but then put in that position, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. No, I agree with you fully, Paul. And being somebody that's been on that side, I can relate, you know, getting to a dock on time and then waiting and then finding out that the first two hours are on the clock. That's like telling anyone else out there that's clocking in each day that the first two hours are on the house. And then after that, you get paid. And furthermore down that point is the fact that the, the pay is not governed. There's nothing regulating what's the minimum pay. I mean, we see 
some atrocious 1099 offers out there and then we see some good ones we see some good w-2 offers and then we see some really crappy w-2 offers uh, and then we see some hybrids uh, like the sliding pay scale which you, you damn near need to be a mathematician to calculate your miles each week mm -hmm. i mean there's so many things that go into these drivers pay We've regulated everything, but we haven't regulated what is the minimum wage for a driver and what should they be making depending on how long they're gone and should they be paid while they're taking a 34 and away from home, not by their choice, but because the job dictates it. Should they be paid from the moment they break down that's out of their control? Should they be paid from the moment they hit a dock? Should shippers and receivers be more uh, conscious of how long they keep drivers tied up in these docks? There's so many things that contribute to what makes a driver's overall pay. I think we owe it to ourselves as an industry to have this topic in discussion more often than it is. Instead of just sitting there and brushing it to the side, it's the way it's always been. You know, one of your popular sayings is it's the way it's always been. It should have remained this way. I'm pretty confident if we sit down and, and really drive down to these points, everyone could agree that this is broken. And we owe it to ourselves as an industry that's trying to move forward and grow to find a way to fix this so we can excite the next generation to want to be part of this. Because no sensible person is going to come in and say, I want to be paid part of the time, but the other part of the time doesn't matter. Well, but the other thing, too, is, is that part of the time where you're not getting paid, like in, in the instance of a customer, you know, like let's say you, you go to, you know, get unloaded and it's supposed to take two hours, it takes eight. That's on duty. That's cutting into the driver's hours. And the driver's not moving, so they're not getting paid. And they might be getting detention pay, but a lot of times that detention pay isn't hardly anything in comparison to what they'd be making if they were moving. And then a lot of times there's a fight with it. You know, we've talked about it before. The driver is the first person to be the bargaining chip, uh, which is, is, is crazy. But you, you look at it and if i don't know like let's say you you have a desk job i just go back to that you know because it's it's what i know a lot of and it's like the idea that like i don't clock out when i have to restart my computer i don't clock out when i have to go to the bathroom kind of like we talked about earlier and it's one of those things there's so many things that drivers do that typically they don't get paid now to be fair there is an uptick of a small amount of companies that are paying hourly that are trying a weekly salary and you know what the best part is none of them have gone out of business because of it so it's almost like things can change. And, and I think we're seeing a movement in that direction. You know, this market has been good for forcing people to be competitive and think outside of the box. And for a lot of these carriers that are willing to be receptive to the feedback they're getting from their drivers, they're experimenting with these models. And like you said, they're not going out of business. If anything, what we're seeing is they're stocked up on their trucks. They're not having much turnover. Drivers are happy. They have consistent pay. Their families are happy. The overall situation seems to improve upon when you make that switch. So I, I think there's a couple variations, you know, much to your point of there's hourly pay out there. There's weekly pay. We're seeing daily pay, which I think is fantastic because you're not even controlling them to a salary. You're controlling them to a pay per day model so you're still rewarding the workhorses for wanting to work more all right but hold on can we can we just take a second i just it just kind of hit me like in today's economy you talked about things people having to be more competitive like you have companies struggling with you know like regular like nine to five employees you know or overnight employees wanting to work remote that's the new struggle for them they want to work remote is it insane that the struggle is these people are wanting to be remote when a lot of the struggle on the driver's side is they just want to be paid like everybody else. Like, hey, I want to work from home. I want to do that. And it's just like, I would like to be paid normal. <laughs> I would like for there not to be an up to and an asterisk next to my salary. Uh, I would like for everything to just kind of pay the same. You know, it, you mean it, just make sense. Right. You know, I would like, you know, and, and I'm not even going to go as far as to say is, you know, like security guards make more than minimum wage. And that driver who parks wherever they have to end up parking at the end of the day due to hours of service, you know, if, it, if it's somewhere sketchy, that driver is still responsible for that truck. You know, that that driver is is guarding a one hundred and fifty thousand to two hundred thousand dollar asset typically. 
And at that point, they're not getting paid to do it. They're supposed to sleep. But if, if that were something that they didn't have to worry about, drivers would sleep with their windows down. They would sleep with their doors unlocked. Idling wouldn't be as much of an issue, but it is a fact of the matter of the world that we live in. And it's like, you know, even if you paid a minimum wage, you got somebody who's out for like, I don't know, like 50 weeks a year, taking two weeks of vacation. If, if you paid a minimum wage for each of their tents, they're leaving over $20,000 on the table. And there's lots that we can drive down on this because it is one of those issues that has plagued the industry for so long. And there are some front runners that are bringing attention to this, you know, besides the, just the everyday conversations that have always taken place and never gone anywhere you're seeing certain carriers make these shifts to make these initiatives to attract new drivers and be competitive you're also having people that are lobbying for the cause finally uh within the industry because no one else is doing it for the industry when we first started talking driver pay no you can't say that now it's become one of those situations where people are starting to be a little more receptive to it um needing drivers and listening to the amount of drivers that are leaving this industry and why people are starting to understand that we have to make a change so in the interest of today's episode let's listen to some of these people and their feedback on what those changes might look like well let's bring on our first guest today on the show we got mike Coble from 10th street talking to us about his views on driver pay how are you doing today, Mike? I'm doing good. Thank you guys for having me. I'm enjoying uh, the podcast. What you guys are doing so far, it's really good. I appreciate you taking the time to come out and join us. You know, today's one of those uh, special topics, hot button issue. We're talking about driver's pay. And we want to get a couple different perspectives as far as what people feel about that pay. Is it outdated? Is it starting to catch up finally? Is it not quite there? Or if we're all missing the beat altogether as an industry? So I know this is a passionate topic that you discuss quite a bit in our conversation. So I thought it was a great time to bring you on the show and share those perspectives. Sure. Um, yes, I, I believe the cents per mile model is outdated. You know, we're we're holding drivers accountable to their ELDs and their time, so they should be paid for their time. You know, and the same with carriers, shippers, and receivers. They we have a product at 10th Street called True Load Time. And what we're doing is we're, we've got a lot of our clients and customers and people putting this data in. So when they go next year to do an RFP on a, on a shipper or receiver, they, they've got data on actually how long it takes for the driver to get loaded and unloaded. They always tell sales, oh, two hours, you're loaded. And we all know that's not true. And the driver's time is clicking while he's sitting there on duty, not driving and not getting paid for it. So, you know, I feel like either a day rate or a hourly rate needs to be looked at. The whole model, the cents per mile model just doesn't work anymore like it used to in the 70s and 80s, I guess. You know, I don't disagree with you on that. Being a former driver myself, you know, there was a lot of times getting to the dock, waiting two hours before someone gets paid. And then trying to collect on that detention after that two hours becomes a struggle between the carrier and the shipper or receiver in any case. And the driver's off in the bargaining chip. Like, oh, it was only 30 minutes past the two hour. We don't want to charge them. So the driver's the one that takes the hit on that. And they just figure it's okay to stiff the driver on the detention pay because they retain the client. But in trucking, the drivers are in turn our client as carriers. We need them to proceed and do what we do for a living. Without the drivers, there is no trucking. So I think we often use them as the bargaining chip at their own expense. And that's where I think we fall short. Uh, I do agree with you that it's outdated because originally when the whole cents per mile thing came in, it was underregulated. So it was the Wild West of trucking. They could drive as long as they felt safe to do so. They didn't have anything governing their time or their truck. And today, there's so many regulations that limit them. And then we add one more. We're paying them in an old-style system that's designed to reward them for miles, but we tell them how many miles they can, how many hours they can drive. And then when they do hit a dock, we're not even paying them for the first two hours or three hours or used as a bargaining chip to retain a client. So I agree with you fully on that. No, I, I totally agree with what you're saying there. We, we've used the drivers as bargaining chips. I can remember, you know, 30 some odd years ago when I was driving for a carrier before I bought a truck, I was driving for 19 and a half cents a mile. 
and I told my wife, well, if we could ever make it to 25 cents a mile, we'd have it made. And, um, you know, there's always more miles to get and stuff like that. But, uh, like you said, I mean, with, with the ELDs, the time, you know, um, driver's time is precious and he should be paid for all the time he's working. I heard a consultant go into a carrier a few months ago and they were talking to operations, talking to sales and everybody said, yeah, you know, you got two hours for free. And they said, okay, well, you guys come to work at eight o'clock in the morning, but we're not going to start paying you till 10 every day. How do you Mm -hmm. like that? And um, nobody wanted to get on that pay structure. They they thought it wasn't good. Can you can you believe that? Yeah, you know I find that hard to believe. I thought they'd all be lining up and taking numbers for that one. I mean, breaks obviously are breaks. Most people don't get paid for breaks in, in any job. But it's it's one of those things where you know the driver and I might be a little bit further out than a lot of people on this, but like the driver is responsible for that truck when that truck is parked. And obviously not everywhere you park is great. Otherwise, idling wouldn't be an issue and people would sleep with their windows down. But that's not the case. So my whole thing is like even at minimum wage, if you have a driver who's out for 50 weeks a year, at that point, they're, if, even if you paid a minimum wage for their time that they're on their 10-hour break, you know, keeping that truck secure, securing that hundred and fifty to two hundred thousand dollar asset, that driver's leaving almost twenty grand on the table easy. Like, do you feel like drivers, because they are responsible for the truck when the truck is parked, uh, should have any kind of compensation for that? Yeah, um, there there should be something, whether it's meal and rest breaks. I know California's been very active about making sure drivers get paid for that. I was just with the TCA in Washington for the call on Washington a few weeks ago, and we were speaking with the Florida senator, and uh, we brought up legal and safe parking. And I I showed them the model of Haines City, Florida, where they've got a um, produce, um, state-owned produce uh, company platform there that drivers know they can legally safely park. And it puts them much closer to their deliveries instead of, you know, parking in Florida is, is at a premium. And, you know, you've got to either be in uh, Wildwood two or three hours away, uh, trying to get into Tampa and Orlando it makes it really difficult. But the state farmer's market there helps the driver. And because it, it puts them closer to their delivery and pickup points, it's not eating up their clock to get up the next morning at four in the morning and start your clock. You could get up closer to eight, start your clock, still make your delivery by nine or 10, whenever you're supposed to be there. We need to look at things like that. And and the government's getting behind looking at other um, parking places more in an industrial area. That is an old trucking warehouse, trucking company out of business that they could convert to legal safe parking, put some facilities in there for the driver. So I'm really glad to see some of that stuff happening and TCA, ATA, those groups, um, One of the things I'm so grateful about my job at 10th Street now, it allows me to be more active with those groups and we can push some of these hot button issues for drivers. You know, pay goes right along with that. If they're going to stay with the cents per mile um, pay rate, then we need to figure out a way to make this easier and more equitable for the driver. I want to stop you right there, Mike, because you're going down a rabbit hole and I, I was holding on to this topic But when we're talking as an industry, how we motivate drivers, pay is often at the top of that list. I think you can agree with me on that. It used to be, not so much anymore. So with us right now as recruiters, one of the number one things we're facing is everyone wants to be home daily. Everyone wants to be home weekly. How do we as an industry encourage the people and reward the people that want to stay out a little bit longer? And I think paying for that time on the road that they're not home compensating them for that sacrifice might help us step in the right direction as an industry to promote that environment that we're trying to usher in with the new generation. Because obviously we can't move freight locally across the nation, every driver home every day, nothing's going to get anywhere and we're going to be in a bigger problem than where we're in right now. These men and women on the road that are our heroes that we regard to, that are supplying us with everything we have, we don't give them any price tag for the time that they're stuck in the truck for 34 hours waiting to get moving and they're not the ones that chose to be stuck in 34 hour countdown every weekend no you're charles you you hit the nail on the head and there are a few carriers some of the big ones that are paying when their drivers uh stay overnight they're they're also paid for drop and hook every time they 
uh, dolly down a trailer, they get paid for that. But those are very few. Um, you know, the, the models that we've lived on in trucking with the cents per mile and other people willing to cut the rate in order to get the business, that has been, um, I think it was Elaine Chow said we were in a race to the bottom. And that was, you know, truly it. What shippers and receivers have done is, you know, pit trucking companies against each other. And yeah, you're, I mean, you're absolutely right. If we could figure out a way to compensate these people for their 10 hour break and their 30, 34 hour on the road. But you and I both know when the wheels aren't turning, the truck's not earning and it's hard to make that money available. I, I, I sure wish, and there should be a way to get together and people figure this out. Wheels aren't turning, they're not earning. Maybe that's the problem altogether, is having a model like that. I mean, it's the only industry that still does piecework like that outside of the gig economy. Um, you know, and I mean, it's the only the only industry, like, trucking has a higher surplus labor than just about any other industry. Like, the thought process is, because that is the current thing. The whole idea of, like, if, if, you're, if you're not, you know, if your wheels aren't moving, you're not making money, is based in the idea that, like, Companies only want to pay drivers at a time where the company can profit off of what the driver is doing. Yeah, I, I, I'm right there with you. So I think we have some outdated systems um, that need to be looked at and, and drivers compensated. But I think things have gotten better, um, you know, certainly with the last couple of years with COVID and uh, the toilet paper shortage, the paper towel shortage and you know, how we needed our drivers, um, it, it, it got better there for a while. But now with this eight and a half, nine percent inflation, all of those gains have been given back. So the drivers are back to where they were two years ago on a, you know, compensation nationally. Yeah, no, I agree with you on that. Uh, we have a long way to go as an industry and it starts right here on this show. When we have these discussions, we share these perspectives and we allow people to see other sides other perspectives and come to their own conclusion maybe someone out there that's listening will solve this problem for the entire industry who knows mike i wanted to thank you for coming on the show uh, i want to thank you for everything you do for this industry and i wanted to thank you most of all for advocating for raising drivers pay and trying to help everyone move this industry forward in a direction that's going to be beneficial for the drivers and the carriers all right so our next guest is john douglas uh he's a driver we've known each other for a long long time uh, you know, he's been W2, he's been 1099, he's been paid uh, by mile, he's been paid hourly, uh, just about every way you can get paid. Uh, so I thought he'd be a great person to bring on and talk about driver pay. How you doing today, John? Pretty good, pretty good. Just chasing that dollar down the hallway. <laughs> <laughs> you getting a whole dollar, huh? A whole dollar? Well, not really, but I mean, it's an elusive bastard. But I'm chasing <laughs> it. Right on. Well, so, I mean, so today's topic that we're talking about is is driver pay. Um so just uh, just broadly from your take, uh, what works or what doesn't work about the way that our industry currently pays drivers? Well, obviously what works is getting paid and getting paid on time for what we do. Uh, you, you, like you said, I've, I've been paid a million different ways driver get, drivers get paid. You know, they get paid salary. They get paid by the mile. They get paid by the hour. 1099, gee whiz. Uh, there, there's so many different different aspects you know they get their base pay and then they get safety mileage pay they get military bonus pay they get fuel savings pay and all this other crap just thrown in on it and um, what works just getting paid on time gee that'd be nice i i believe from our previous conversations we're both kind of in the camp that the driver the driver pay is broken uh what 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 would you say is is wrong with the way that drivers are typically paid in our industry today well for instance like right now so so the company that i drive for now like i drove i drove for them locally (laughs) so i've actually been paid three different ways with the company i'm with now um i was lp so i was 1099 i had some things go wrong uh, health wise and they were kind enough to hold a job for me and, and kept me on and I was, I decided I'd stay around the house and they put me on local. So I stayed by the hour and something else happened <laughs> in my life. And now I'm getting paid by the mile. Oddly enough, when I worked hourly, I, I got paid almost the same as what I'm getting paid by the mile now. So I was home every night by that, uh, by the hour. So I was local. I was a local driver. 
so now I'm home. I'm home most nights. Um, now the other night I wasn't home and there are nights where I'm out and I can't quite make it back. Um, but I still get pretty close to the same pay. So then in your experience, how does that translate to like full blown over the road, like out, you know, like a week or more? Uh, where are you, are you making more or less do you think than, than what you're, you're making now? So as an LP, so what it translates into. So here's, here's, here's how that works. So basically is what they do is they, 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 they sucker you into this under the guise of, of being self-employed and being your own boss and, and you call your own shots. So basically is what they do is they call you in and on this deal and, and you have all the risk. You pay, you pay everything, pay your tags and title and all the crap, the fuel and, and, and the maintenance, you know, they, they, they suck you into a maintenance program and all this other crap. When it's all said and done, they take everything off the top and they pay you. I don't know what people are getting paid out there nowadays, but I mean, if, if you're lucky enough to bring home 2500 3000 and now you got to take taxes out of that. What do you think, in your opinion, as a driver, could the industry do to f- fix or what changes could they make uh, to make that more appealing and more of a viable career choice? Uh, there's a lot they can do with, with the merge or, or layover. You know, some, some companies, you know, they wait for two hours. So you have an appointment time. they got to wait two hours until after your appointment time to start paying that. Um, and even then, it's it's a meager pay. I mean, it's not... It's not worth your time. They don't pay drivers for being over eager, you know, for getting there early. Uh, they only they only bitch at you when you're late. So if you got a if you got a noon appointment and you're there at ten o'clock, well, that demerge or that that uh, detention pay doesn't start till your appointment, which is at noon. So now you don't start getting it until two. There's four hours out of your day that you're not getting anything. Your wheels aren't turning. You're not getting paid. You're just sitting there with your thumb in your butt. What's what's the incentive of getting there early? Well, exactly. There is none in most cases. There's so many things that go into this, and it it is really unique to each shipper or receiver. Um, I've had places where I've delivered where they count your time in at the security gate. I've had places where you have to wait till you get through security gate, which you have no control over, and then they count your time from the time you hit the dock. I've showed up to places where you get there an hour early and they send you to the back of the line and then they mark you late. By the time you make it through the same line, they send you to the back of. I understand that pain uh, that you speak of because it is, it's ugly. And there is no win scenario for the driver in this. And often, like I referred to earlier, the driver becomes the bargaining chip. Well, I mean, also on top of that, you have those two magic words that you see all the time. <clears throat> Up to. <laughs> Up to, Exactly. <laughs> Man, if you don't read the fine print, you're screwed. Or like, oh, hey, we pay 95 cents a mile, but also we pay 35 cents a mile, but then we pay, you know, additionally after like three months, you start to get a safety bonus or a fuel bonus. Yeah, 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 95 cents a mile. Yeah, it totals up <laughs> to 95 you cents. You got to do this, this, and this. Yeah, you got to you got to jump through all these hoops to get that. Then you got to get a note from your mom. You got to be 37 years old, and you, you got to get yeah, you got to run 38,000 miles in three day i mean it's just unattainable so obviously you know we can talk about this and these are super important conversations uh but i think it's important for a lot of people who are listening who aren't a driver um to kind of have some context you as a driver who is remotely optimistic about the industry you love it you you've had options to go other places you didn't um you know as far as industries go it what is your outlook on driver pay? Do you think it will ever get better? Do you ever think it won't be convoluted? Uh, do you ever think it'll make sense? And do you think carriers will ever get away from trying to fight for every bit of surplus labor that they can? So they're, they're never going to stop fighting. I, I don't believe that the sense per mile will ever change. We'll never go to a, a standard way of, of, of pay. There's too many major carriers that, that, that control the price of things. Um, you know, you got carriers that are that are subscribed to the National Survey of Driver Wages that, that, that control uh, that control the wages and the, and the driver packages, and, and, and there are too many variables that, that control the way things are now. The only way it's going to get any different is when Elon Musk finally has his way, and there's there's autonomous trucks all over the damn place, and all those drivers are displaced. 
I mean, they, someone's still got to sit in the truck, and I bet you they'll still probably pay those drivers per mile, even though they're not even in control of the vehicle, <laughs> let alone the time, the location, and, and, and the speed. <laughs> but I super appreciate you being out there doing what you're doing. You know, you know how I feel about it. Love you, man. Um, and hopefully we'll have you Love on. You, for, we'll have you on for another episode sometime soon. That was some exciting stuff and perspectives regarding drivers' pay from both John Douglas and Mike Coble. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean it's it's pretty solid. Um, and I mean, I think it's one of those things too, where, I mean, I think, uh, we, we all agreed more than we didn't. Um, and I think ultimately what it boils down to is it's just, it, it's, it's so abstract and, and almost archaic the way that, that we pay drivers and it doesn't, uh, it doesn't make sense with the way that anybody else gets paid. No. And if you listen to our driver guests, what you would realize is that's the almost the sense of hopelessness of the change anytime soon if not at all which is something as an industry i think we need to pay attention to we we had a driver on the show that does not think that we are capable of making a substantial change in the right direction to me that's a call to action to the industry that we need to step up more now than ever yep i would love to see it i mean i'm kind of in the same school of thought i mean it was it was pretty devastating to hear it from john um, you know, but it is one of those things. It's like, you know, it comes down to it, like, you know, starting to talk about, you know, like, Hey, you know, the driver needs to be paid, even if they're not necessarily doing something kind of like an office employee doesn't always, you know, like they're not always 100% productive all of the time, but a lot of times it's not necessarily their fault for a lot of those things. And it's just one of those things where when you start to talk to people about it, like, hey, maybe we should pay for this, then that starts to cut into profits. That's an uncomfortable conversation. It's always uncomfortable to talk about money, but at the same time, we need to talk about money because it's these people's livelihood. These drivers out here running, this is their livelihood. This is how their family is supported. This is how their mortgage is paid or their rent or whatever their living situation is. This is how they eat. This is everything to them. And they're everything to us. Literally, like, I don't know why we're out here trying to make it weird and skimp on pay to literally prevent the end of Western civilization. It will always go back to that at the end of every episode for me, I promise. And I'll, I'll tell you, being with growing up in this industry and seeing how many things have changed for the better, it, it is discouraging to find that we're still here hadn't maneuvered far at all from where we were when I was a child and this was the discussion. The only thing is, is there's more people raising attention to it, but not by far, not by much. And as an industry, I think we've really fallen short of what we owe it to our heroes of the road for their sacrifices to make sure that they're compensated in a fair manner, whether it be daily pay or a minimum guaranteed weekly pay for being out for a certain amount of days whatever it is we've over regulated everything can we regulate them getting paid fair wages yep and i think my my ultimate takeaway i think really is there's a lot of people who say you know like we we've talked about it you know recruiting for retention retention is recruiting blah, blah, blah. And then when you start to talk about retention, people say it's not just pay, it's communication and drivers want to be treated with respect. I still stand by that 100%. Communication and respect are huge. And I think sometimes they can go a long way, you know, like next to pay. But the other thing is everybody's talking about how are we get more people into the industry? How do we get more people to want to be in a truck? That's where that pay change comes in. Because you look at that not knowing that's intimidating as hell. And even though someone's telling you, oh, you could make sixty-five to eighty thousand dollars a year, easy. You know, up once to. you get a, up to, <laughs> you know, once you once you get a couple of years under your belt or whatever. But the fact is, is that's not much better than a lot of other jobs that are available now, specifically with remote work. You know, a lot of a lot of drivers live in more rural areas because there's not a lot of jobs available. But now there are due to the increase of remote work. There's a lot more competition in the workplace and we are falling even further and further behind. And I think it's owed to drivers, no pun intended, to take a look at pay. No, I agree with you fully. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've gotten into a cab or an Uber and found out in conversation that that's a former driver 
And then the conversation comes, what caused you to get out of the industry? What caused you to be in the Uber rather than in the truck? Did you not like it? And they're like, no, we loved it. It just, this gets me home more often and I'm making the same amount of money, if not more. That alone is a testament to where we have fallen short. So I love the insights that we got from our guests today. I look forward to the feedback from our listeners as far as what's your views on. Maybe someone's got that silver bullet answer of what this should encompass as far as drivers pay. But until next time, this is Sense Per Mile, and I'm your host, Charles Gracie. And I'm your co-host, Paul Gibson. Don't skip on paying the people who make all of this possible. Thank you for tuning in. Looking forward to seeing you next episode.